Today we're going to talk about vehicle inspections. The pre-trip inspection on your police car should be done prior to the beginning of each shift because no one knows if or when you'll have to use your vehicle in either an emergency or a pursuit mode. Would you go to work in the morning and start your shift without checking the condition of your firearm? Would you go to work for your evening shift and not know whether there was a magazine in your weapon or not? I think not. Yet we get in our cars every day and drive them without regard for oil, air pressure, lights, or practically anything else. We just assume it's going to be ready. And in police work, you know as well as I do when you assume you can suffer dire consequences. If your department has a written checkoff list and require you to use it, then be diligent when you fill it out. Those things become permanent records. And if your car is involved in an accident, you may be asked to bring those documents with you and they could become very important. One thing I would really caution you about is your mirror adjustment. If I went to each one of you watching this video's car today, about 95% of you have your mirrors adjusted improperly. Now let me explain to you the proper way to adjust your mirror for police work. So you take your head, lean it to the driver's side window, and adjust your left mirror to where you can barely see the left tail lamp of your cruiser. Second, lean to your right about 30 degrees and adjust the right lamp, I'm sorry, the right mirror to where you can see the right tail lamp of your car. Get whatever you can out of the center of your mirror. We know it's not much because you've got a cage, possibly people back there, but get what you can out of that. Now your mirrors are properly adjusted. If you have your mirrors adjusted that way, you will never be involved in a lane change accident. Assuming, of course, you look in your mirror before you change lanes. Now, we teach people to back. We teach police officers to back their cars in. And as you think about how I've told you to adjust your mirrors, you're thinking, wait a minute, I can't back in a parking spot with my mirrors adjusted like that. And you know what? You're exactly right. You cannot. You actually need to take your finger and push the button and move the mirrors in about an inch or two, and then you can back in the parking spot. It takes about 10 seconds. Consider the installation of a convex mirror on your left mirror on the upper left side if your car does not have one. You can see in the next PowerPoint slide a picture of what your mirror adjustment should look like from the driver's seat. And as you can see, there's very little bit of the left rear tail lamp available. This particular slide shows a view of the right tail lamp. Again, you can barely see the corner. And as we all know with the things that we have in our police cars, this shows a picture of your view of the rear, rear center mirror and you can get what you can get out of that. Be especially careful if you drive a Ford product. These new Fords have very high rear windows and backing is extremely difficult with them. I've actually put a, just a visual on this particular slide for you to see the lanes that the mirrors actually cover when they're properly adjusted. And as you can see, if someone begins to pass you on the left or right, that individual mirror pertaining to that lane will pick that vehicle up and hold it in your view until that vehicle gets to your B pillar, at which time your peripheral vision will take over and you'll never have a lane change accident. This is something you can take home to your wife, your husband, your family, your kids, your friends. When you get in your car and begin to do your vehicle inspection, are all your lights working? If there's a light on your police car, it needs to be working. You certainly wouldn't want to drive around with one headlight out and then be subsequently stopping people and issuing citations for one headlamp, would you? So take the time to turn all the lights on your vehicle on and walk around the car and make sure they're all working. And we provide an example of what that might look like in this particular slide. And the subsequent slide, of course, shows the rear of the vehicle. Obviously, it's important to keep these lamps clean. I suggest that when you wash your windshield, you wash your headlamp covers and your tail lamp covers. It may save your life. If you have a pre-trip inspection report, follow it. If not, we've provided one on the following PowerPoint slides. 
to sort of give you an indication of what you should do and how you should go about your inspection. I suggest that you develop a routine and do it the same way every day. It becomes second nature and you won't miss anything that way. So things like the cleanliness of your vehicle and overall condition needs to be looked at as you approach the vehicle. Uh, you want to make sure your seat belt's properly adjusted, your seat's properly adjusted. The hood latch is tight after you've looked at the mirror and the oil and the uh, belts and those types of things under the hood. Check your fuel gauge. I say to you that you should always drive around with at least a half a tank of fuel. Who knows when that next hot call or long pursuit may be coming. Make sure your windshield wipers are in good condition. Windshield wipers made today in America will generally last about six to seven months. After that particular amount of time, the end of the rubber begins to roll and you'll start to get streaks, you'll start to leave spots on the mirror, on the windshield. And once that happens, it's time to go get some new windshield wipers. There's been a lot of discussion about whether you should buy expensive windshield wipers or inexpensive windshield wipers. And I found that they both last about the same amount of time. So I say, whatever's on state price contract or whatever's on your city contract, just use those, they'll be fine. But when they begin to roll, replace them. As far as your tires go, make sure that they're properly inflated. We're going to talk about that just in a minute, but make sure also there's proper tread on there. Any, if the wear bar is showing, you're down to 230 seconds, and as you'll see in a later slide, you're very susceptible to hydroplane situations should that occur. I'm going to show you a photograph here of the proper distance to have your seat from the steering wheel. You notice in this particular photograph, the officer has his wrist sitting on top of the steering wheel. Now that's not how we're saying you should drive, it's simply giving you a gauge of distance. You'll also notice when in his arm that there's a slight bend at his elbow. So that's the proper position for that officer to be from that steering wheel in that seat. You may be different. You want to stay as far away from the steering wheel obviously as possible, but you don't want to hyperextend your elbows and have your arms locked out when you have your seat properly adjusted. You'll notice in this particular slide that the police officer has his thumbs on the outside of the steering wheel at, at 10 and 3 or 9 and, and 9 and 3 or 10 and 2. Uh, some driving instructors around the country are actually suggesting 8 and 4 because it keeps your hands and arms away from the airbag when it deploys. Any of those three positions is fine. The key is don't put your thumbs inside the steering wheel. When that airbag deploys in the event of a crash, it deploys at 200 miles an hour in 1 20th of a second. If your thumbs get pinned between the steering, the steering wheel and the airbag deployment, bad things will happen to your thumbs. Bad, bad things will happen to your thumbs. So this particular slide shows you the proper hand position. This particular hand position also allows you to flutter steer better and gives you probably more control of the car. We talked about tires just a minute ago. Let's talk about tires further now. It's important that you use the tire that's manufactured for that particular police car. If you'll open your driver's door and look on the B pillar or on the inside of the driver's door, you'll find a white and red sticker with a tire on it. And it will give you the proper size and type tire for your particular vehicle. It will also give you the proper inflation value for your particular tires on your particular vehicle. Don't use the tire inflation number on the tire. Use the tire inflation number on the B pillar. It adds to stability. People think that tire inflation is not an important event, but in fact it is. If we think about NASCAR drivers, they change tire pressure by as little as a quarter of a pound to one tire, and it makes a huge difference in the race. You can imagine the difference in the stability of your police car if you've got 25 pounds in one front tire and 45 in one back tire. Tremendous instability. So do yourself a favor and make sure that the tire pressure that's for that particular car is inflated properly on those particular tires. Now, do your tires match the vehicle specifications? On the side of the tire, you're going to find a set of numbers that should correspond to what's on the driver's B pillar. Also make sure if you're driving a marked police car that's speed rated that you have speed rated tires. You'll see in this particular slide that there's a variety of tire designations for a variety of speeds. As a police vehicle, you need to be dealing with tires that are Y, X, or Z rated. 
probably the majority of them will be W or Y rated. So if you look at the bottom of the PowerPoint slide, you'll see that that 88W or 99 wire tire is the speed rated tire for that particular type of vehicle. So chargers, uh, the interceptors, those types of vehicles need to have these speed rated tires. If you use a cheaper tire that's not speed rated, it can actually come apart at these high speeds, which could cause catastrophic consequences to you and someone else. Now, proper tire flation is, is vital. Most of these police car tires are, are supposed to have about 35 pounds of air in them, and that becomes important. You'll notice on this particular slide that I have a bunch of different poundages of pressure and speeds in mile per hour, and it correlates to driver hydroplane. If the water depth on the road exceeds the tread depth of the car, you're in a potential hydroplane situation. Again, it has, it has nothing to do with how good a driver you are, it's simply physics. If there's not enough depth and tread to squirt the water out the sides of the tire sipes, then basically your police car becomes a set of skis. And if you've ever seen video of this, you'll actually see the tires come off the pavement and see nothing but water between the tire and the pavement. Pretty scary. If you look down on this slide, about five down, you'll see 35, mile, 35 pounds per square inch of pressure. If you've got that much in your tire and you've got good tread, you're still in a hydroplane, potential hydroplane situation at 60 miles an hour. So think about this the next time you're out in inclement weather driving on a limited access highway at 70 or 75 or 80 miles an hour. With 35 pounds of air in a brand new tire, you're still in a potential hydroplane situation. Obviously, if you haven't checked your tire pressure in two months and you've only got 20 or 25 in there, you can look down the chart and see what kind of terrible shape you could possibly be in. Let's talk for a minute about backing. In the old days, all police officers were taught to back in everywhere. You could always identify a police car marked, unmarked. You could identify a police officer's personal vehicle because he always backed in a parking place. For some reason, we have sort of got away from that, and I'm not sure why. But you need to back, and you need to back in every time. Think about it. You pull in a parking lot. You're finally going to get some lunch. You survey the parking lot. You see a place to park, you pull in. You get about two bites of that cheeseburger down and you get a hot call. You run, you jump in your car, you look behind you quickly, throw it in reverse, and lo and behold, somebody has backed out from the other parking spot and you hit them. All that could have been avoided if you'd backed in the parking spot to start with when you weren't in a hurry. It gives you a much better field of view, it's much safer, and it allows your car to be much more maneuverable in the event you have to leave somewhere quickly. So back in every time and pull out every time. Unfortunately, the majority of police car accidents in Kentucky that are non-injury accidents are backing accidents. They happen every single day across the Commonwealth. We back into telephone poles, we back into gas pumps, we back into other police cars, we back into citizens park cars, all because we're not backing into a parking place. Let's change that in Kentucky. Let's back in every time. And remember, before you begin to back in, you need to readjust your mirrors. And before you get out of the car to go in and have that nice cheeseburger that you've been waiting for for so long, remember to readjust your mirrors back out to the proper position so that when you leave, that's not one of the things you have to worry about. Thanks for today.